Your average American today is consuming about 77 grams of added sugar every single day. So if you break that down, that's like 20 teaspoons of pure sugar. Just try to visualize that, right? Like 20 teaspoons of added sugar. Sugar for which we have no biological requirement. Everyone wants to know, what are Max Lucavera's foods to truly avoid? What are the foods that are reaping havoc on our systems, the ones that we should stay away from, for sure the non-negotiables for you. Yeah, so I mean, I think at the top, you really have to talk about ultra-processed foods, which um, above the conversation regarding carbs, fats, uh, animal protein, plant-based protein, it's really the ultra-processed foods that now Americans are consuming. 60% of the calories that your average per adult consumes come, comes from ultra-processed foods. For children, it's even higher. It's like 70 to 80%. And these are the shelf-stable, packaged, processed foods that line our supermarket aisles. They're minimally satiating. There was actually a study that um, was funded by the NIH, came out in 2018, lead researcher Kevin Hall, found that when you give adults ad libitum access to ultra-processed foods and told to eat to satiety, so eat to the point, just the, the point at which in the wild they would, they would achieve that sense of fullness, right, that gratifying sense of fullness, that they would actually end up eating a 500-calorie surplus um, whereas when they were switched over to a minimally processed foods diet, they ended up coming in at a 300 calorie deficit. So that, that's an 800 calorie swing determined solely by the quality of the food mm -hmm. that people are eating. But again, today, people are over consuming these ultra processed foods. It's no wonder that by the year 2030, one in two adults are going to be not just overweight, but obese, right? These mm. are the foods that are at the foundation of the obesity epidemic. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Food number one is get rid of, or at least minimize your consumption of ultra processed foods. I'm human, I still am around uh, packaged shelf stable foods and every so often I, I like to indulge, but it's just being mindful of yeah. our tendency to over consume those foods. Too often when somebody tries to adhere to certain dietary guide rails, right, and, they, and they're unable to do that, they feel a sense of moral failure because willpower is a finite resource. And, and then they start to doubt their ability to get to reach the state of better metabolic health, of better of a better body composition. But it's the it's the foods, it's the foods that are designed with the explicit intent of driving over consumption mm -hmm. that are that are the problem. So getting rid of those. I think added sugar would be number two. Um, and generally added sugar, ultra processed foods, they tend to go hand in hand. Um, but your average American today is consuming about 77 grams of added sugar every single day. Oof. So if you break that down, that's like 20 teaspoons of pure sugar. Just try to visualize that, right? Like 20 teaspoons of added sugar. Sugar for which we have no biological requirement. Sugar, I think one of the biggest problems is that it, it's hidden in most cases, and so therefore it's insidious. It's just it adds up. It's not like it's one product in particular that's leading to that sugar deluge, it's that it's found in sauces, it's found in commercial breads, it's found in coffee drinks, right? You can go to a big coffee chain and just buy one beverage that has basically the entire 77 grams of sugar that your average American is consuming um, right there. And I think there are a lot of problems with added sugar. Now, your, your own personal tolerance to added sugar will depend on, obviously, your calorie needs, how active you are. But in general, there have been studies that have shown that one single high sugar bolus can actually elevate systolic blood pressure um, in, to a degree that persists for two hours after ingestion. They use about 77, 75 grams of sugar um, in that study to see that effect, which is usually the amount of sugar that they'll use in an oral glucose tolerance test, but that's like what we're consuming every day, mm -hmm. right? They also found that um, one high sugar meal was enough to reduce testosterone by uh, a similar degree. Again, persisting for two hours afterwards. We know that testosterone is really important for mental well-being, body composition, um, libido, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Men and women both rely on, on testosterone. So added sugar, I think, is a, is a, is a big problem. And then I'm an, an advocate of avoiding grain and seed oils. I know that this is a more controversial... Um, well, it's controversial within the medical and nutritional orthodoxy. I don't think it's very controver controversial for like listeners of your podcast, for example. Um, but it's the oils like the canola oil, the corn oil, the soybean oil. We have to do our best to minimize our consumption of these oils. They're predominantly polyunsaturated fats, which, you know, the, 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 the medical or orthodoxy and the nutritional orthodoxy can't see past the fact that they do lower LDL cholesterol, which provides some degree of value, right? But these oils are so 
the, the polyunsaturated fats that these oils are, are predominantly comprised of are damage prone. They're prone to this chemical degradation known as oxidation. And studies have shown that commercially available oils, you take a random sampling of these kinds of oils, soybean oil, canola oil from the supermarket, they are already, they've already reached a, thresh, a threshold of oxidation um, that we really ought to be skeptical of um, in terms of the safety. Um, and then we cook with them, we consume them in restaurants where they're kept in fryers and they're heated and they're reheated and their fried foods are prepared in them. So we're ingesting these um, oxidized oils and then on top of that, byproducts of oxidation like certain aldehydes, which we know are mutagenic. Um, and, uh, and they also contain trans fats, which is another problem with them. We know that there's no safe level of, of man-made trans fat consumption. In fact, the FDA banned partially hydrogenated fats for that reason. But trans fats are still in the food supply in these oils because the production chain, one of the production steps that is required to create these oils is deodorization. And deodorization creates a small but significant amount of trans fats. Mm -hmm. And dose makes the poison. A little bit here and there, fine. I certainly ingest some when I'm eating out in restaurants right. um, because that's what restaurants typically use. Those are the kinds of oils that restaurants use. But it's just that the, the standard American diet is now awash in these oils. And it's, it adds up, it all adds up. It's like this insidious nature whereby your average adult now is probably consuming um, a, a level of trans fats that is probably not doing their health any favors mm -hmm. due to these, the, the production um, that these oils require. And for these oils, when we're ingesting them and they're already at the close to oxidized point or processed and then we're cooking with them, that's affecting our body in multiple ways, including inflammation? Yeah, well, a damaged fat damages you. And we know that you are what you eat with regard to these types of fatty acids, right? They're actually worse from this, um, than sugar from the standpoint of sugar, you know, you either will burn off the sugar that you ingest or you silo it later on as sugar um, to be utilized as a form of energy, which if you're performing high intensity exercise, um, glucose yielding carbohydrates provide value, right? For, for the active person, for the exercising person. But these oils, we know that adipocyte concentration of uh, linoleic acid, which, which is the predominant fatty acid found in these oils, has increased up over twofold over the past 50 years alone. Um, we know that these oils, uh, because they are so easily oxidized and those oxidized fats then get chugged along on various lipoproteins, um, chylomicrons, for example, LDL lipoproteins, which gives those lipoproteins a more inflammatory phenotype. There was a study that was published in 19... 99, um, which showed that because these fats, they're damaged, they get chugged, they get tugged along by these uh, lipoproteins, those lipoproteins are then more easily able to get taken up by a monocyte, um, which is an immune cell, which is early, an early um, step in the cascade that ultimately creates atherosclerosis, right? So, uh, and then of course, like there are the brain effects. There is no real solid research to um, to cite with regard to the effect that these oils have on our brains. Um, but because I think they affect systemic health, cardiovascular health, um, I think we ought to be really um, weary about, about over-consuming them. Um, they, do, you know, they do lower LDL in comparison to saturated fats, but it's the other, it's the other problems. And on top of that, um, we know that Extra virgin olive oil is the staple fat of the Mediterranean diet, which is the darling of the, the of the nutritional orthodoxy. They're not using these polyunsaturated dominant oils in that part of the world. It's the use of extra virgin olive oil that's associated with the robust risk reduction that we see in people who adhere to the Mediterranean dietary pattern. And oleic acid, which is the predominant fat found in extra virgin olive oil, is much less prone to oxidation mm -hmm. because it's more saturated. Mm -hmm. It's not a saturated fat, but it's more saturated than these PUFAs. And they've shown that, that when our lipoproteins are, for example, enriched with oleic acid, that they're less prone to that inflammatory phenotype. They're less likely to get taken up by um, these immune cells. Um, and so for me, it's really about getting rid of those, at least, at least my exposure to them in my own kitchen and, and relying more on extra virgin olive oil and avocado oil, which are uh, much more chemically stable. Hey everyone, I wanna talk about Birch Living. There's a partner that I've been working with for quite some time. You know, sleep is a number one, top 
pillar for overall health. Super important to me. I'm always excited to talk about Birch because the bed is so important at giving you a restful sleep. So Birch is a premium mattress in the box company. They make mattresses and sleep products that are stylish, comfortable, and environmentally conscious. They're organic, non-toxic, my favorite buzzword of all. Non-toxic mattress are made right here in the United States. They recently introduced the Birch Lux mattress. Now as an upgrade from the original, well-loved, super popular Birch Natural mattress. The Birch Lux takes comfort, luxury, safety to the next level. It's crafted with responsibly sourced and sustainably produced materials like organic cashmere, organic New Zealand wool, fair trade cotton, and 100% natural latex. It's got eight different layers. The Lux was specially created with breathability and support in mind. Natural materials allow for increased airflow that keeps you cool and comfortable throughout the night. I can attest to that. I am not sweating in this bed at all. I feel nice and cool in the mornings every single time. The natural non-toxic latex relieves pressure points, which I can attest to also. It's like I'm being held by a cloud. While the targeted zone lumbar support provides enhanced contouring. The mattress has 1,000 individually wrapped steel coils to cradle your body and limit the motion transfer. So if you have a partner sleeping on the bed or your friend sleeping over, you ain't gonna wake up because even if they're moving around, the individually wrapped steel coils are holding you. And one of my favorite aspects of this is the third-party certifications of several of them. GOT certified, organic, Green Guard Gold certified, Fair Trade certified, Wool Integrity, NZTM, and Forest Stewardship Council service, meaning that it's a non-toxic bed with all the standards that are needed from my eyes to make sure that I'm safe long-term on this bed, but it also has the integrity of being environmentally conscious. I've had my Birch Lux mattress for about six months now. I love it, I'm comfortable, I ain't waking up sweaty. I'm feeling like my body's being held and at peace every morning. With your Birch mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial with a 25 year warranty. If it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried, you can get more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they're gonna come pick it up right from you, you're gonna get a full refund. The best part of all this is that the Birch delivers your mattress right to your door for free within the US. And it comes rolled up in a box, super easy to set up for yourself. I love my Birch mattress, I think you will too. If you're looking for a new bed, I want you to check out Birch. You can click the link below or go to birchliving.com slash heal thyself and you're gonna get $400 off of your mattress plus two free pillows. All right, I hate to break it to you, most probiotics don't work. It's an industry that has a lot of products out there that aren't doing your body justice the way you think it is. If you ever struggle to find a good brand, I'm gonna tell you why. To be truly effective, a probiotic must be able to survive that long trip from your mouth to your gut. And the majority of these probiotics, even the special refrigerated ones, will die in the harsh stomach acid environment well before they're gonna get to where they're needed in your colon. That's why I'm a fan of the Just Thrive Probiotic. Their exclusive strains are designed by nature to put up an armor-like shell around the capsule when the conditions get rough. And this was put to the test. There were studies that proved that Just Thrive Probiotic arrives 100, 100% alive in your gut and ready to go to work. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, Dr. G, I've been using these probiotics. They haven't really done anything. And some people saying, I use a probiotic, I think they help. But most of the time you'll find probiotics really evade what they market themselves to do. And because this probiotic is 100% alive in your gut, you'll see that it's uniquely effective at controlling things like gas, constipation, bloating, heartburn, whatever digestive issues you're suffering with. Their vegan, non-GMO, gluten, dairy, soy-free formula. It's a probiotic I have in my cabinet. It's the one that I use daily. If you go to the website, you're gonna get 15% off site-wide on any Just Thrive all-natural products when you go to justthrive.com and use the code DRG at the checkout. Yeah, I remember growing up at my babysitter, she had a huge uh, plastic bottle of canola oil. Yeah. And then there was the, um, I remember the safflower or the sunflower oil, and it was just everywhere. And that's what she cooked with all the time. And uh, to think how popularized they become even more and they're used and realistically, almost every restaurant probably uses them. And uh, to, to think that there's in the conventional orthodox paradigm, we don't see past the LDL. We go, no, but it lowers LDL. This is every cardiologist is behind it. Exactly. But everyone else, especially the functional docs and, and everyone within that world and nutritionists, we're all just like, what's going on? Why are we still consuming these? Yeah, I think that the, the worst way to consume them is in fried food, mm. by far. Um, and I do think that 
oils, they're, they're, they're sort of like a spectrum, right? Like canola oil is better than soybean oil because canola oil has a higher proportion of oleic acid, mm -hmm. which is that monounsaturated fat, right? And then you have sunflower oil. There are multiple type. there are different types of sunflower oil. There's high oleic sunflower oil, which yeah. is actually pretty benign because yeah. it's mostly oleic acid, um, which is what's implied by the high oleic um, denotation. And so, yeah, I think it's 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 knowing how to knowing the fats to look for and and you just can't get around the fact that extra virgin olive oil it's like the hierarchy of evidence extra virgin olive olive oil has been shown in so many different kinds of studies to be promotive of health why would we want to use anything else right exactly and um, talking about the high oleic sunflower oil there's now some oat milk companies that are specifying the type of sunflower oil they're putting in there because they know people are privy to like wait a minute. What are these seed oils? I heard about this on this blog or this podcast. So um, it's cool that some companies are actually specifying uh, the which uh, the, the 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 value of the oil and how saturated or unsaturated it is. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think. It's, I mean, I think it's. I think it's an important step in the process. I mean, oleic acid is, um, and I talk about this in Genius Kitchen. Oleic acid is the most abundant uh, fatty acid found in nature. Mm -hmm. We're made of it. Um, oleic acid is an important constituent of the myelin sheath, mm -hmm. which protects our, our brain cells. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's, breast milk is rich in it. The fat in grass-fed beef and salmon, it's about 50% oleic acid. Mm -hmm. And olea, it's actually named as such for the olive. Like mm -hmm. it's, we originally identified and, and named it because of its um, preponderance in extra virgin olive oil, which humans have been consuming for thousands of years at this point because yeah. it's so simple to make you just crush olives it's only the past hundred years that we've been consuming these um highly uh monetized yeah. grain and seed oils like canola oil corn oil and soybean oil yeah. and again a little bit here and there isn't going to have any significant effect on your health um but i really believe i think that we need to take the precautionary principle with these kinds of fats mm -hmm. i mean they, they've only been in the human food supply for the past century and we're just we're consuming more and more and more of it because of the pre because of their uh use in these ultra processed foods yeah, yeah. there's a, a restaurant in hermosa beach in manhattan which strictly uses uh avocado olive oil, olive oil or coconut wow no other oils and i remember the first time i went there for dinner i had a big meal i, I had like everything on the menu and usually if i eat that much i'm in I have a stomach ache, I'm in worse yeah. pain. I kept eating, I felt so good. I felt so, my stomach usually cramps up. I can tell when a restaurant's using canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, um, any of the oils that we need to be staying away from immediately. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's, I think it's the grain and seed oils, it's the grape seed oil. Yeah, the grape um, seed oil. Any, oil I mean, if, if there's an ad on TV for it, I think uh, it's something that you're better off uh, avoiding. Yeah. So, so ba back to the processed foods. Are we? Uh, you, you mentioned the study where people are overeating by 500 calories. Is it because they are devoid of fiber? They're they're increasing sugar. Are they, what are they telling our brains that why why do we need to consume more of it to be satiated? Oh man, such a good question. Um, so I think all ultra processed or the the majority of ultra processed foods, the especially the kinds that we're prone to over consuming, they have this characteristic that food scientists refer to as hyper palatability. Yeah. So. It's just that they they combine flavors and and often mouthfeels that send your brain to a bliss point beyond which self control is just futile. Mm. And what they generally signal is caloric density. Now we live in a time of food security right now, but for the vast majority of our of our evolution, um, food security wasn't something that we could rely on. Right? Food scarcity was was ubiquitous. And so a food that's highly calorie dense, we're programmed over millennia um, to We've been programmed over millennia to uh, to embrace those foods and mm -hmm. to consume them when we have access to them. Right? We don't have um, it's it's not in our DNA to to pump the brakes on a food that's so cal calorically dense because that food for a hunter gatherer would have been a life saving food right. when calories were scarce. Today, calories are um, plentiful. Right? We live in, in in a time where, for the first time in human history, there are more overweight people walking the earth than underweight. Mm -hmm. So calories are abundant, right? And so that's where there's this mismatch between our food environment and our, and our genes, right? So it's that, that, that plays a large role, the hyperpalatable aspect of these foods. But then I think what also has, has 
has come into play, which has created essentially the perfect storm for the obesogenic food environment, is the fact that these foods are minimally satiating. So proud and happy to partner with Higher Dose, one of the hottest companies out there right now. They're blowing up and they have an infrared therapy line. If you wanna experience the powerful benefits of infrared therapy, Higher Dose has a portable infrared sauna blanket. I have it at home. And you feel the difference after just one session. So infrared increases the blood flow for faster recovery, better sleep, and one of my favorite ones, a calmer overall nervous system. Plus, it naturally releases a dose of those happy chemicals that make you feel good, make your body buzz in a good way from your brain, leaving you feeling euphoric. If you don't have the budget or the room for a full-size sauna, these sauna blankets play a really important role in your health. The blanket pays for itself in a few sessions and is a game changer. I personally utilize the sauna blanket when I wanna go away and I'm not gonna have my at-home sauna, I'll have something portable where I can make sure that I'm doing my body good on my getaways where I'm healing and rejuvenating and recuperating. But also, for those of you who wanna experience the benefits of infrared without the sweating, they also have a really cool infrared PEMF mat, and it comes in two sizes. It combines a powerful technology of infrared with PEMF for an unbelievable recharging experience. PEMF stands for Pulse Electromagnetic Field. And the way it works is it sends electromagnetic waves through the body at different frequencies to help promote your body's own recovery process. And remember, the best medicines are the ones that work with the body. So what you'll feel is relaxed, grounded, and rebalanced. And I can attest to this. Anytime I'm exhausted or overexerting myself, I go on the PMF mat and I feel like I'm grounded. I feel like I'm recharged and rejuvenated for the rest of the day. So the way I use it is I do it in the middle of the day when I'm starting to get burnt out from running around so much. But these mats, they're built with a thick layer of 100% natural purple amethyst crystals in mesh fabric tubes across the entire mat. The smaller one fits comfortably in an office chair so you can recharge while you're working. And the regular size mat is good for stretching, doing yoga, meditating, or just chilling and watching TV. Whether you deal with chronic pain, working frequently, or just need a moment to relax like so many of us, lying on these mats a couple minutes a day will help ease your mind and your body from the inside out. And I really do love my mat. Like I said, I'll use it in the middle of the day. Sometimes if I'm watching a movie, I'll just fire it up and there's a setting where it can really warm up. So it's nice and relaxing too. Uh, but you can get your own infrared sauna blanket or your infrared PEMF mat at higherdose.com. They have an awesome website too. They have an awesome Instagram page today and use the exclusive promo code DRG15 at checkout and you're gonna get 15% off site-wide. Or just go to higherdose.com slash heal thyself. So what makes the food satiating, there are three factors that I like to talk about. One, which you mentioned, is fiber. So we have no biological requirement for fiber, but fiber does uh, satisfy the microbes that live in our large intestine. And it seems that fiber consumption is associated with longevity and reduced inflammation, um, and it's satiating. And it's satiating because it mechanically stretches out the stomach. Fiber absorbs water, and when you stretch out the stomach, in so doing, you turn off the release of a hormone called ghrelin, which mm -hmm. is the hunger hormone. So packaged processed foods, ultra-processed foods, tend to be fiber deficient. Where do you find fiber? You find fiber in fruits, fruits and vegetables. Um, ultra-processed foods are not those, right? Right. The third... Uh, factor that makes a food satiating is its protein content. So we have an innate requirement for protein. Protein is an essential macronutrient. And it's been posited that our hunger me mechanisms are driven almost entirely by our requirement, not just for protein, but the micronutrients that high protein foods tend to contain. And this is called the protein leverage hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So when we ingest protein, it satiates our hunger really well. It's the most satiating of the macronutrients. Close second would be fat. Um, and that's because fat slows down the, so fat, fat actually can prolong the satiety inducing effect of protein. So that's why, um, and I'm not a carnivore dieter, mm -hmm. but that's why people that adopt the carnivore diet, they're eating protein and fat. That's all they're essentially eating. Yeah. And so you see them get shredded. I mean, carnivore dieters generally are, um, they don't have a problem like getting, getting lean because their diets are just that satiating, right? And then the third factor that makes, oh, and also, and ultra-processed foods are, tend to be depleted of protein. Their protein's been diluted because A, protein is expensive. 
Um, and ultra processed foods tend to be this combination of sugar and fat and yeah, they're generally low protein foods. The third factor that makes a food satiating is the water content. Now water has been all but depleted from shelf stable packaged processed foods because water impedes the shelf stability of a food because it, it attracts mm -hmm. mold. And a lot of the time I think when you're hungry there's this, there's this uh, adage in the, in the wellness um, fitness world that if you're hungry try drinking some water first because oftentimes the signals uh, with regard to hunger or thirst get, um, they cross paths. And this is actually true when you think about it. It makes perfect sense because when water ceased to be available for a hunter-gatherer, the second best place that they would, they would get their needs for hydration met would be food, right? We all know that food, fruits and vegetables and even animal products are a great source of water, right? So um, we know that water is satiating, packaged processed foods, depleted of water. So it's those three factors um, that all play a role in in, in the reasons why these foods tend to drive their own overconsumption and why when we fill up on them, we've already overconsumed them. It's mm. because they're depleted of protein, fiber, and water. And then, of course, the fact that they're, that they're hyper palatable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're tastier than any natural food really um, will be. You know, it's just like natural foods don't, don't taste like that. So that's why people, when they're starting out on, this, on the journey to wellness, really ought to reacquaint themselves with what real whole foods taste like. Mm -hmm. Which, which in many times, I mean, me, I ate all those foods when I was a kid. It was hard for me to eat fruits and vegetables because my tongue, right, my, my whole palate was just used to that and wanting and expecting like the tidal wave of sugar, the tidal wave of salt, the tidal wave of fat, and just it, it hitting my bliss point every time. Uh, so no wonder so many children, wasn't just me, still so many children, like you said, 80%, are like, I don't want these fruits and vegetables. It tastes nothing like the, the gummies or the, the crackers that I've been eating. And it's, it's wild. It sets up like, a, a, like an unrealistic expectation. It's, it's mouth porn, mm -hmm. essentially. You know, it's like, I think one of the reasons why pornography addiction is actually rising in, in prevalence among, uh, among males, and I think it's because it, it's, it's the proximity, it's the ease with which it's accessed, and it's ultimately the hyper palatability yeah. of digital porn. Like, mm -hmm. it's so unlike real authentic encounters, mm -hmm. um, sexual encounters like that, that adults actually have, yeah. that it's making people dysfunctional in a sense. Yeah. Um, and so the same thing, it's like the same exact, from a neurobiological standpoint, it's the same thing that occurs with ultra process, uh, hyper palatable ultra processed foods that mm -hmm. in short circuits are, are reward pathways. Mm -hmm. And we come to expect this insane over the top flavor from our food. Always. Yeah, always. Now, the beautiful thing is you can actually cook foods in your own kitchen that have that same hyperpalatable characteristic and use healthier ingredients to boot and use those three satiating um, factors, right? Foods that are high in protein, uh, foods that are high in fiber, foods that are hydra hydrating ultimately. Um, so it's really important to kind of have that knowledge in place so then you can, once you like see the matrix, right, then you can start to manipulate it. Yeah, 100%. And that's sort of like what we're doing with the book, right? You're showing us, hey, here, the, the matrix here, stay away from this. You can enjoy really high quality nutrient dense foods in this manner and you're gonna feel better, right? Where your biology isn't going crazy. Your neurochemistry isn't going crazy when you're consuming these foods. And you could finally find a piece in your body where you're going, wow, thank you for rewarding me with these nutrient dense foods. Uh, which everyone, I mean, that's that's very much so encouraging for me. I'm ready to make some food this weekend on, on that book, man. I'm excited. Yeah, dude. It's uh, It's been a really fun journey. I think one of the biggest factors that, um, that one of the biggest mistakes that home cooks mistake, home cooks do wrong um, is that they under season their food. And adding salt to food, I think, is a big is something that people really need to start doing again. We've been told for decades at this point that salt is our enemy, right? That sodium is bad. But there's a lot of great research now coming out that's challenging that notion. And also, we have to remember that the vast majority of sodium that your average American intakes comes from ultra-processed foods and restaurant food, fast food, um, food that's prepared in restaurants. Only 11% of the sodium that your average American ingests comes from their own salt shaker, from the salt that they add to their own recipes when they're preparing food at home, right? And sodium is a macro mineral. It's an essential nutrient that we need to ingest every day for good health, and yet we've demonized it. Yeah. Studies are, are now showing that it's not even necessarily the ingestion of sodium, but it's the underconsumption 
of minerals like potassium, like magnesium, that play a role in um, high blood pressure and in, in ri risk for cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And not everybody, I mean, to be, not every, only a minority of people, about 25% of people are um, sodium sensitive. So the vast majority of people can eat all the sodium that they want and not see their blood pressure increase. Mm -hmm. But sodium is also, sodium consumption today is a, is a proxy, a surrogate marker for the consumption of ultra processed foods. Mm -hmm. So more sodium, obviously worth health, health outcomes. But it's the processed foods yeah. that are that are the biggest problem, and, and sort of how we do studies in the in the past, right? Where we're taking all of these uh, processed foods, saying it's high with sodium, and then we demonize sodium yeah. as one of the ingredients that we need to stay away from because we know these foods do this. Uh, it it happens so much in nutritional science, but I myself, man, I put I have my I have two giant things of salt uh, right in my pantry, and I'll put it on everything. I'll even put a little bit in my morning lattes. Uh, because I know my body needs it, and my blood pressure is always perfect. Um, I've never been sensitive to sodium. Some of us are, but um, do you, so we can use it liberally in your book. Yeah, I think it's, I, well, I think cutting out the ultra processed foods is important, and then once you do that, or at least minimize, then you, you really, yes. I mean, go, like, so, salt is so, it's, it's, the ch it's one of the cheapest and most effective ways to take a single food component or, or a single edible edible item and turn it into food, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there are multiple, there are different kinds of salt that um, have differing effects. So, I mean, my favorite thing to bring into the kitchen is flake salt, like Maldon salt. Maldon yeah. is like one popular brand. But to me, having that in the kitchen is like the easiest and most cost-effective way of really elevating your cooking to restaurant quality. Um, it's also a way to make healthy but bland foods palatable. Yeah. I mean, try eating broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, under-seasoned, without salt. You, yeah. you need salt. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially like if you're trying to get your kids, right, to eat, to eat more healthily, more fruit, more vegetables. You definitely, I mean, you definitely have to salt the food well. And if they're on a diet that is that is minimally processed, um, then they're gonna, they're gonna need that sodium to feel better. Mm -hmm. And then you throw into the mix um, vigorous activity, right? Which increases your uh, excretion of electrolytes, which predominantly sodium is lost when you sweat um, yeah. vigorously. You need to ingest more sodium. If you're on a low carb diet, insulin, the hormone insulin holds on to, uh, causes our bodies to hold on to sodium. And on just one day of a low carb diet, you've halved your pancreas is secretion of insulin. So that causes you to drop sodium. Um, you need to get in that salt if you're initiating a low-carb diet to help avert the low-carb flu, which mm -hmm. a lot of people experience. Um, sweating profusely, I mean, I'm, saunas, exercise, like these things like cause you to sweat. And that's a good thing, right? Because when you sweat, you sweat out certain toxins. Um, but you gotta, you gotta bring salt back to the table. I sauna regularly, and if I don't... Um, I, if I don't add electrolytes to my, to my drink, like while I'm sauning, I, I leave the sauna feeling depleted. Whereas the sodium helps me, it, it, it maintains my blood volume, makes me feel good mm -hmm. afterwards. A hundred percent. I can't go in the sauna without, I have my water bottle and there's electrolytes in there. If I run out the electrolytes, I'll put, I'll put in salt. Now there's like a common misconception that it's going to dehydrate you, but that's not true. That's not true at all. So uh, uh, utilizing the salt, and then there's some magnesium, some potassium. Man, I come out the sauna and I feel refreshed. I feel like, you know, I come out the shower after the sauna and I feel good. My body feels like a detox, I feel strong. But I've, I've made the mistake many times of going in with just like plain old water with nothing infused in it. And I've been exhausted, man. Yeah, you just feel like you're more prone to lightheadedness. Yeah. Um, it's just not good. Also, I'll add, which I think is, is really funny, um, that the number one source of dietary sodium in the American diet, it's not processed meat, it's not canned foods, it's bread and rolls. Mm. So bread and rolls are the number one source of dietary so sodium in the standard American diet. But when was the last time you heard a dietitian advise their clients, right, to avoid bread and rolls or to minimize their consumption of bread and rolls? No, God forbid you cut out the bread and rolls, right? It's avoid using your salt shaker. That's, the, that's the, the, the dogma that we hear echoed over and over and over again from the medical orthodoxy. But it's so misguided, right? Mm -hmm. Salt is such a powerful culinary tool, right? You take a ribeye, and without salt, it's just a slab of meat. But you apply a little bit of salt, 
prior to grilling it up and you've got a steak which I know you're not into. Yeah, but it changes but it changes yeah. the game. And I remember changes when I did it was I would never eat something without seasoning like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, on on veggies like I was lucky in that I grew up my mom loved to season vegetables and she seasoned them well, right? Awesome. But I think a lot of people that are going to these like more extreme diets, I think in particular like the carnivore diet mm-hmm. which um uh you know, anecdotes are I think we still need to listen to the fact that certain people seem to be um they see a reprieve from you know, certain symptomology when they adopt it. But I think a lot of people will adopt that diet because they just haven't had well-seasoned vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me, like teaching people how to prepare veggies um, in a way that is palatable, you know, maybe even hyper palatable, Mm -hmm. um, really important because it can be done. It Mm -hmm. can be done. What are some of the other favorite spices for veggies that you use or, or hacks that we can approach for people listening to make our veggies taste better? Oh man, I'm, well, I'm a huge fan of nutritional yeast. Oh, you are, you love it. I love it, yeah. Okay. I love it, it's like one of my favorite ingredients. Okay. Um, are you a fan? Yeah, 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 I have, I have a big thing, the Bragg's one right in my, yeah. in my pantry. It's so good, so I have a recipe in my book, it's uh, cheesy baked eggs with broccoli, but it's like cheesy in air quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, I basically saute up the broccoli with a little bit of avocado oil, which is a uh, super heart healthy monounsaturated fat, You throw in the juice from a whole lemon, a little bit of lemon zest, some coconut cream, a tablespoon of coconut cream and two two tablespoons of nutritional yeast in the broccoli and you saute it up, you get the broccoli nice and soft and it's amazing. It's this Mm. combination of like the savory from the nutritional yeast with the the acid from the lemon. And that by itself is just, is amazing. You can use that as as a side for any number of dishes, but um, then you throw some eggs on top of it um, and then you put it in the oven for about 15 minutes. Um, and it ends up being this like really savory, creamy, delicious dish. And uh, and I think nutritional yeast is like definitely plays a, a big role in that. You can also throw it on um, popcorn, which is a, a very yeah. high volume snack. You know, yeah. you can eat a, popcorn's one of those snacks where you can eat a lot of it for relatively few calories. Yeah. Um, and it's a good source of fiber. Corn is a di- I'm not anti corn. Um, I try to minimize my consumption of grains, but. Uh, an ear of corn. I mean, that's like a that's an unadulterated. That's as whole grain, as you know. That's as whole of a grain as whole grains can get. Yeah. And um, and you know, there's like some carotenoid value in uh in in whole corn. So popcorn, I think, is like a is a decent snack. And nutritional yeast on that. Yeah. It just ups the 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 nutrient density. I love that. So yeah. nutritional yeast, easy hack. Anyone easy could hack. go and get that in their supermarket and, and utilize it and, and just can be liberal with it, really, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not like there's a bunch of sugar in there or a bunch of salt in there. We, we can just utilize it the way we want, right? Yeah, well, that's a great point that you bring up. Herbs and spices um, really are a way of adding really um, bold flavors to your food, but doing it in a way with um, negligible calorie contribution, mm-hmm. which the same can't be said for sauces. And sauces, I think, underlie one of the big problems with the standard American diet. We just love sauces in America. We we love to eat bland food that we then drench in sauce. And sauces, whether it's sugar or fat, add a ton of calories, like like en masse. Um, Herbs and spices don't do that. They add negligible calories to your food. Um, But in fact, they do add a number of really important bioactive compounds that that, um, we know support health and longevity. In fact, people who consume spicy food have reduced risk of early mortality by about 14%. Mm. Um, and I think it's due to these like bioactive compounds. Yeah. And there are hundreds of spices used by people around the world, but a handful of them have been the subject of, of vigorous uh, research. Um, cinnamon is an example of, of, of one of those uh, spices that um, has been shown to have an anti-hyperglycemic effect. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that turmeric, has curcumin in it, which is a, an anti-inflammatory compound. Um, they all possess, they're all really concentrated sources of polyphenols, which we know support gut health. Um, so herbs and spices, I think, are knowing how to master the, the, the utilization of herbs and spices. I'm really anti, um, like, I'm more about quality of ingredients over quantity, but stocking your kitchen with an array of spices, I think, is like, to learn how to use them yeah. um, appropriately in food is a really wonderful gift and a, and a really, I think, valuable endeavor um, in the kitchen. Yeah. You don't yeah. need that many, but like cinnamon, garlic, 
cumin is, is wonderful on so many different things. Mm -hmm. Some good high quality salt. Uh, black pepper is yeah. great. Um, there are so many. You don't you don't need many, but it's like it's a really great. Um, yeah, great to dip your toe into that pool. For sure, especially to I mean, it brings your meal to the next level. Yeah. You're, like you said, there's polyphenols in there. There's anti-inflammatory co components, turmeric, anti-cancer, the cayenne. I always, I, I, I love spice. Yeah. So I'll right. add in uh, some in there. It, it, I'm always motivated when I'm cooking. I open up the pantry uh, drawer and I, so I can just see them, you know? So then like when I turn around, I was like, hmm, I'm kind of feeling this flavor today. Yeah. I'm far from mastering because it'll taste like Mediterranean <laughs> with Greek and Italian. You know, there's no, there's no consistency, but. That's funny. At the very least, I know that I'm getting these nutrients. Herbs and spices are, for me, the easiest hack in the kitchen to up-level your meal, always. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, plant-based milks, uh, cow's milk, sheep's milk, uh, dairy as a whole. Yeah. Um, and your opinions, because I know you've done a lot of research on this. Uh, I, myself, it does not work well with me. I already know if it, dairy's in the plate, my stomach is hurting, mm. my, my, my stomach's bubbling, I don't yeah. not feel good. Um, but what's your approach on from the whole thing, plant-based milks and animal-based milks and conventional and organic and grass-fed everything? Ooh, I like this question. Yeah. So I use I use like almond milk um, for like if I'm, what do I use almond milk for? Well, predominantly I have like these like keto cereals that I enjoy sometimes as like a treat. You know, I so love like, cereal, man. Yeah, I love cereal. That's like my the weakness. format yeah. of cereals, just like whoever invented like the first cereal with milk. God bless them. Yeah, God bless them. Um, so I'll use like almond milk for that. Uh, with regard to almond milk, you know, there's like the OG almond milks, um, which I actually like and use because they have, when you buy the unsweetened variety, they have like 30 calories in a cup. So it does the job. Very, very low like calorie contribution. There are, um, a lot more like quote unquote natural almond milks on the market now that use a lot more almonds in their, in their production, but the calorie content is much higher. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's just, it's worth being kind of aware of that, right? Like for me, if I'm, if I just want a little bit of almond milk to like use in my cereal, I'm using the OG stuff because very low calorie contribution. Whereas the more artisanal almond milks now can have like upwards of 150, 200 calories mm. in a cup. So they're thicker too. Yeah, they're thicker. You just don't, you generally don't want to drink your calories. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's generally going to be true, um, with regard to anything, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's almond milk or sugar sweetened beverages or or fatty drinks and the like. With regard to dairy, my views have kind of um, evolved over time. I think that dairy, yes, a, a large portion of the population is lactose intolerant, um, but most uh, like fermented dairy, hard cheeses, things like that, um, heavy cream, even butter, you're not going to really get a lot of lactose mm -hmm. um, in in those products. But I do think. Full fat dairy in particular is a good source of some really cool nutrients like fat soluble vitamins like A, E, D, and K. So you do get you do get some interesting um, micronutrients in full fat dairy. I also think like dairy has this uh, there's this interesting science now surrounding dairy fat. Like dairy proportion proportionally has the highest percentage of saturated fat of any other food group, and yet consistently we see from observational research that People who consume full-fat dairy have actually reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, um, and that's a, that's perplexing because you know we do know that saturated fat drives up LDL cholesterol, mm -hmm. which when it's too high, that's a risk factor for for cardiovascular disease. Um, but dairy fat doesn't seem to have that effect, and I think it's because of the presence of something called milk fat globule membrane, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it essentially changes the way our bodies interact with dairy fat. And, um, and, and it's one of the reasons why they've shown in clinical trials that heavy cream, for example, has a neutral effect on, on blood lipids, whereas butter, which has had its milk fat globule membrane disrupted by the churning process, butter actually does cause an, an elevation of LDL. And when you ask yourself, like, okay, so what is this weird bubble that encapsulates the triglycerides of, of milk fat? Milk, milk's purpose is to grow uh, a neonate into a, I mean, ultimately into a, into a self-sufficient baby animal, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the case of bovine dairy, it's to grow a calf into a cow. The most, the organ that's under the most rapid growth and development 
in that phase of life is the brain. So milk fat globule membrane, actually when you break it apart and look at the, its actual constituents, has a number of compounds in it that are really supportive of, of, of good brain health. Mm. It's rich in phosphatidylcholine, which is an important part of the phospholipid bilayer that forms our brain cell membranes. And it also is, a, is rich in something called sphingomyelin, which is an important um, component of myelin, which is the, you know, the myelin sheath insulates our neurons. It's destroyed in, in conditions like multiple sclerosis. So I do think that um, dairy has just a number of interesting nutrients and can be supportive of, of can play a role in optimal health. A lot of people mm -hmm. say that dairy is inflammatory. There have been a, a number of meta-analyses that show that dairy doesn't really have like a, a, a pro-inflammatory effect. Now, obviously, some people are going to be sensitive to casein. Some people are going to be sensitive to lactose. So there's no one-size-fits-all recommendation. But if you're not sensitive to it, I think that full-fat dairy can really play a, can potentially play a supportive role. There was a, a study that came out. So I tend to go down rabbit holes, and I'm particularly interested in brain health. And um, I was like, okay, so are, are, is there any observational evidence linking the consumption of dairy with maybe reduced risk for like Alzheimer's disease. And there was a study that was published um, by this guy, Oriel Willett, who's a researcher whose work I've been following for some time now, who does a lot of research on, you know, dietary patterns and dietary components with, with brain health outcomes. And it was a food frequency questionnaire study, so these aren't the most reliable. But what he found was, it was very interesting to me as I was going down this like dairy rabbit hole, was that dairy was the one food component that seemed to confer the best, the strongest risk reduction, so mm -hmm. the strongest degree of protection against the development of cognitive, cognitive decline over a some odd, I forget the, the, the follow-up, but it was like a multi-year study. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation, but I do think that dairy has a number of like really uh, important, um, potentially important compounds in it. Some intriguing effects too. Yeah, overall. some intriguing effects, yeah. Yeah, and, and one, I know it's not for everyone. Some people don't like me react. It doesn't matter if it's butter, if it's ghee even. It's, it, I've, my stomach is always hurting, but that's been since I was like six, mm. you know? Um, but it's a bio-individual aspect of everyone, you know? And um, to keep an open mind to it, I always say, um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. So when you say there's the full fat and then the butter, and the globule is disrupted and churned out, it, that's the spectrum. Then, so if someone was to want to take it in therapeutically, dairy, is it better for them to go for full fat versus instead of butter? Yeah, I would go for like the so butter and it's it's very interesting. Butter and heavy cream start from the same foundational product, right? It's yeah, cream. yeah, yeah. It starts as heavy cream. But butter seems to have a negative effect on LDL, mm. whereas cream seems to have no effect. So it's due, they think it's due to the presence of this milk fat globule membrane, because otherwise the products are the same. But we know that milk fat globule membrane is, is disrupted yeah. via the churning of, of butter. And so I used to think of, of butter, I, well, I'll just put it this way, I used to consume a lot more butter. I still use it um, you know, in moderation, but I consider it now uh, an indulgence. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to have the same vitamin content, the same fat soluble antioxidant, uh, fat soluble vitamins as the heavy cream, mm -hmm. but it's the presence of that. It's the lack of that of that globule membrane, which which can lead to an impairment of like the lipids. And I'm genetically probably prone to hypercholesterolemia, so that's why I'm a little bit more cognizant of that. Yeah. We know that brain health relies on cardiovascular health, um, and observationally, again, full fat dairy, as opposed to low fat and and fat free dairy seems to be associated with better cardiometabolic health, lower mm. risk of type 2 diabetes, lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, I think that it's, you know, there, there's a major confounder here in, the, in that reduced fat dairy tends to be more processed. It tends to have um, added sugar in it. Uh, you know, like I think a lot of, one of the, one of the more common l reduced fat and fat-free dairy products consumed by Americans is yogurt, which often has added sugar and other crap yeah. in it. Um, but yeah, it is interesting. It is interesting that it's this paradoxical effect, right? Because it's like, now we know it's clear that saturated fats aren't, aren't all created equal. Mm -hmm. So if you were to recommend dairy for people, it would be the full fat yogurt or the full fat milk or the full fat cheese? Um, I would generally, yes, with the exception of... Um, fat-free Greek yogurt, which I think is a great food for, from the standpoint of protein. 
Mm. Um, because in an 80 calorie cup, you get about 19, 18, 19 grams of protein. Of, of protein. Yeah. So you're just you're skimming off the fat, but you're you're we're not. So I'm talking about plain unsweetened. That's that's like the, the important caveat. Um, but yeah, you're you're basically like reducing some of the fat calories and increasing the protein concentration mm. with. Um, so I buy like I'll buy like fat free or reduced fat um, Greek yogurt. Uh, but other than that, yeah, with cheeses, with like heavy cream, um, I'm all about it. And yeah. obviously, though, they're going to contain more calories, so you still have to be kind of cognizant of like the calorie your your own calorie needs. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm pro. I'm pro full fat dairy. So when it comes to the quality of it, is there a difference in the conventional versus like the grass fed or the organic one? Is do do you talk about that at all, or is, or do you see not not really much of a difference? Um, grass fed makes the biggest difference. Okay. Yeah. So you want your dairy to come from grass fed cows, which increases the the nutrient density, increases the vitamin K two content. Um, I mean, dairy is not a significant source of omega-3 fatty acids, but there was a there was a study that showed that um, organic dairy did have a higher um, concentration of omega-3 fats in comparison to like wild salmon, for example, or right. algae. You know, an algae supplement. Uh, it's really kind of nominal, but um, but yeah, I mean, what a cow eats dictates the healthiness of its fat, as well as the fat content of its um, of its of the dairy that it produces. Yeah. So, yeah, I would if you're if you're eating lots of full fat dairy um, on a regular, I would look to pasture raised or, or grass fed. Okay. Cows. All right. Yeah. Well, you heard that first over here. Yeah. We're talking about yeah. So, um, the last part I wanted to talk about. You mentioned uh, when we started the show about uh, reducing the toxicants in your in your home or in your kitchen. Uh, what are some things we can start looking out for right now that were really important or something that you found where it was like when you put in your book, this is something that I need to talk about for everyone um, because you find that it's really significant to our overall health. Yeah, I mean, it's such an important one. And I know that you're super passionate about yeah. this too. Like it's a bit, it's a big topic and um, I, I tried to do it, uh, I tried to give people sort of like an overarching guiding philosophy yeah. um, in the book without going too in, into the weeds. But generally you want to reduce your exposure to plastic in the kitchen. And this is a big, like big issue, I think, whether it's the kinds of um, containers that we're storing our food in or even reheating our food in. Plastic exposure is probably the biggest modifiable um, uh, exposure that most people have to uh, these endocrine disrupting compounds, whether it's bisphenol A or other bisphenols um, or uh, phthalates um, or parabens. Parabens are found in food, can be found in food. So I think reducing your exposure to plastic, getting rid of the plastic Tupperware, you can actually use plastic to store dry foods in. Like that's mm-hmm. not a big deal, but it's the wet, the salty, the acidic foods, um, the warm foods that you really want to keep away from plastic. And for that, I would use like a Pyrex. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can easily go and buy Pyrex like glass yeah. uh, containers from like you, you know your local um, department store. Using uh, generally um, getting rid of like the nonstick pans. There are a few pan brands on the market now that claim to be free of PFAS chemicals, um, which is generally what you want to look out for. I have no like financial affiliation with them, nor have I vetted those companies. You you probably have. I don't. I mean, but I did. I, I did. I did some on cookware. Yeah, you, know, you did. did you okay, know? yeah. Like I don't know the. I can't. I haven't validated the authenticity of their claims. You know, but I, I would imagine that it's a lot like the game of chemical whack-a-mole that now exists with the bisphenols. You yeah. know, like you'll see plastics with you know, BPA free, um, indicated on the, on the package, but that doesn't mean that they're free of all bisphenols, right? Exactly. They've just removed BPA to appease consumers and now they're using BPS or BPF Mm -hmm. or, um, so I, I don't know. So in general, I, um, I try to minimize using these nonstick items and instead I have a, I have a cast iron pan, which is very versatile. Um, also for people who don't eat much meat, um, a cast iron pan can add iron to your food, mm-hmm. um, which is which is great. And with the right seasoning, which I, I share how to properly season a cast iron pan in the book, um, you can actually it can have a nonstick effect. So that's cool. Uh, so it's a highly versatile kitchen item. I'm also on board with using um, silicone uh, in the kitchen instead of plastic. Mm-hmm. It's generally um, chemically inert. Um, can withstand high temperatures, yeah. and so yeah, I would say that that's that's pretty safe. 
Um, aluminum foil, I think, is something worth minimizing your, your exposure to. I'm not saying aluminum foil is dangerous, but there have been studies. Um, there was a German study in particular that found that when used to marinate, uh, to marinate fish with an acidic marinade, led to this dramatic leaching of aluminum ions into the food. Mm. Uh, so I still use aluminum foil when it's the safest option. Um, you can't use parchment paper, for example, in, in every cooking yeah. context, but, uh, but aluminum foil um, generally is something that I think to be, just to be minimized, not because I have any data to say that aluminum foil drives X disease state, but right. it's precautionary principle. Right, right, right. I love those hacks, man. Those are so easy. Right, because everyone listening can just make that intervention right now. Yeah, and and I love what you said about the plastic being the biggest modifiable one because we are everyone has BPA in their urine right now and phthalates and and parabens. It's it's crazy. So knowing what it does to our hormones and our whole system, it's it's such a good intervention. But amongst everything else, yeah, I mean I use silicone myself and I threw away the plastic. Uh, what do you call the, the the skillets? Yeah, I threw that away, and and I and I utilize uh, silicon now. But easy, easy hacks, man. Um, well, the book, where are we gonna find it? Uh, is it out for the people? Like we we want to know all the details first and man. foremost. Man, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Um, it's called Genius Kitchen. If uh, the book comes out March 29th, okay. So depending on when you listen to this, you can go to geniuskitchenbook.com for links to all of the different stores. Um, if you live outside of the U.S., there's a link to a store called Book Depository, which offers free worldwide shipping, which is awesome. But generally, it's, at, it's available in every bookstore. Um, and, uh, and if you pre-order it, we have some really great like bonus goodies that we're giving away at GeniusKitchenBook.com. Um, but yeah, it's available everywhere, and I'm, I'm super active on, on Instagram, and I've got my own podcast called The Genius Life. I've been on it. Which you've been on. Uh, yeah, we had a great, great episode. Yeah, that was an life. awesome episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone go listen to that too. That's that's my other favorite one, aside from this one. Uh, awesome stuff that you cover. Amazing guest. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to open up this book this weekend, make some goodies in here. I mean, some of the stuff we talked about already. I mean, like, look, blackberry avocado and basil salad. Look at this. Yeah. Put it right on the camera. Look how beautiful Damn. that is. That's, yep. The photography is awesome. The photography is awesome. So things like this, man. Actually, wait, there's a recipe in here that, oh, man, I want you to try it. It's a vegan carrot noodle mac and cheese. Mm. It's so good. It's hyper palatable. That's what I want. But it's amazing. I need hyper palatable. The photo in there is like. And, and dude, this is funny. I'd open up to my biggest weakness, pancakes. <laughs> I was a chubby little kid because my mom would make me pancakes all the time. Grain-free, blueberry, orange pancakes with coconut cream. Oh, my Jesus Lord. This yeah. is going to be really good, man. So everyone, go check out the book. Pre-order it because the goodies are out there for everyone. Um, and find Max on Instagram at? At Max Lugavere, L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. And the website? Uh, GeniusKitchenBook.com. Awesome. GeniusKitchenBook.com. It's everything you need to know everything about the book. And uh, yeah, just hit that up. All right, you heard it here. Max Lugavera on the show. The book is Genius Kitchen, Genius Guy Making Genius Foods. Thank you, Max. Thank you, brother. That was Max Lugavere. Man, the way that he explains nutritional concepts in such an easy way is so helpful for all of us. What a blessing he is in the nutritional front and the overall health front. I can't wait to open up that book this weekend and start making some of these recipes. I hope you all get it, get the book, and check it out for yourself. As always, rate, review, subscribe. Thank you for supporting the show. So many, we're on what, year three, and we're doing it big every single year. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week.